Can everyone see the slides okay? We do. Excellent. So thanks for inviting me. Uh, I am here to give you a brief introduction to reef keeping and talk a little bit about the Wasatch Marine Aquarium Society. Um, so who am I? I'm, I'm the president of the Wasatch Marine Aquarium Society. Uh, this year, our, our presidency rotates around every couple of years. So um, I've been a member of WAMAS for about the last five years. And I've actually only been uh, reef keeping for about five years. I actually joined the club before I even had a tank. Uh, it was one of the ways that I decided to try and learn more about uh, saltwater aquariums and what was necessary to to uh, maintain a tank. Um, my wife and I spent our honeymoon out in Hawaii and while we were out there snorkeling we had seen this crazy fish that uh, I grew up around lots of freshwater fish and I'd never seen a fish that actually swam like this. Um, this fish that you see on the screen uh, is commonly known as a rectangular trigger fish. It doesn't swim with its tail very much. It actually primarily uses its um, top and bottom fins and it, it almost moves through the water like a flying saucer. It's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, and so I was so enamored with that fish that when we came back I had thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could have an aquarium that has that fish in it? And I started looking into what it would take to be able to do that. Um, unfortunately, during that, that research and discovery, I learned that it's actually a fairly aggressive fish. And if I was to have a tank with that fish, there's a lot of other things I wouldn't be able to do. So I still currently don't have that fish in my tank. Um, but uh, it, was, it was the inspiration that got me into reef keeping. And uh, it's been it's been a pretty exciting journey since then. I've I've learned a lot of stuff, and uh, it's been a lot of fun learning all the things about the uh, uh, various animals that that live in my tank. So, um, who is the Wasatch Marine Aquarium Society? We we're a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to the support of the hobby of marine aquarium keeping. Uh, we promote responsibility and education of marine hobbyists. So how do we do that? Um, we're, we're actually one of the largest aquarium clubs in the nation. Um, we started back in, in 1995 uh, and have been going strong for, for 25 years. We got a lot of um, amazing members in the club. Um, some, of the, some of the guys that actually started the club, one of the guys is a uh, marine biologist that teaches at uh, the university. Um, and so we, we have a pretty uh, diverse group of people that are, that are very uh, experienced with reef keeping and uh, very educated. And so having that, that group of people that you can uh, talk to and share information with and ask questions has, is really, really helpful if, if you're starting to get in the hobby and, and aren't quite sure what you uh, should or shouldn't do. Um, we're also a member of MASNA, which is the Marine Aquarium Society of North America. Um, we do stuff uh, throughout the year to support reef preservation and marine conservation. Um, we've had speakers over the years come and talk to us about um, reef conservation. Uh, we hosted the, uh, a, a premiere and an early showing of Chasing Coral, which is a, a really amazing movie about um, the uh, ongoing destruction of the reefs around the world and and what might be what might happen to them in the future it's it's actually it's a really interesting and educational but at the same time it's a little depressing to see some of the stuff that um, we've been doing to our natural resources around the world um, our club has about 100 to 120 paid members annually. Um, it fluctuates from year to year, but we actually have a whole lot more people who do come to our meetings and shows because we um, don't require you to be a, made, a paid member to actually participate in any of that. Um, if you're interested in ever um, finding out more about WAMAS, uh, we do meet every month, uh, the first Thursday of each month at the Sugar House Park. Uh, on the east side of the park, there's a, a small building, the Rose Garden building. Um, and uh, we have a, a presence on Facebook and we have our own uh, website and forums that you can, you can check out as well. Um, uh, 
a little more about what we do. Um, like I mentioned, we have uh, monthly meetings. Sadly, through the pandemic, it's we've had to cancel a lot of our meetings because um, we just can't have you know 50 to 100 people meeting in a in a small building um, the risks are just way too high um, but we do we regularly bring in uh, well-known speakers in the uh, reef keeping community to talk about uh, different things uh, our last speaker came and actually talked about um, uh, both saltwater and freshwater keeping because he's been he's been involved in uh, both aspects of the hobby and he talked about uh, what he called um, dark water uh, tanks and they were uh, based on the environments you would find in uh, rivers particularly in like um, rainforests and stuff so you might have a tree that's fallen over and is decaying and there's an, a completely different environment in there where the water is really dark and murky and has full of tannins and there's lots of different uh, kinds of uh, critters that will enjoy that situation and so he specializes now in trying to set up uh, tanks that that recreate that environment it's pretty cool and really really interesting uh, talk um, throughout the year we we have various events that we do uh, we do a reef tour each year that's kind of like a parade of homes but specifically geared towards um, inviting people to come in and see the various aquariums that uh, our members and, and people throughout the Salt Lake Valley have. And it's a, it's a great opportunity to get out there and see different kinds of uh, marine tanks and uh, what kinds of things are possible. We also host a uh, local fish store tour. Um, Salt Lake City is pretty amazing in the number of um, fish stores that we have. Most cities, you know, you go out to Los Angeles and they might have three and they're hours apart from each other. Um, we have 10 plus stores here in the Valley. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. We have, we have a lot of people that are in the hobby and we have a lot of uh, support locally. Um, so it's pretty easy to get in and, and do stuff if you're, if you are interested in that. Um, we host a frag stock show each year that um, is, uh, some years we actually have two. Uh, it's just a, a place where you can come and buy corals, uh, fish, um, various things that you may need. Um, we, we bring in vendors from all around the area and uh, you can get some pretty amazing prices there. Um, and then we also do some fun social stuff like every winter we have a, a formal banquet that we host in one of the large aquariums, either the um, Loveland Living Aquarium or sometimes up north at uh, Sequest. Um, we do a, a summer barbecue for all our members um, to, to sort of uh, get everyone together and and then we also do some some Saturday excursions beyond our regular meetings where we'll go out and do things like there was one we went to um, a a local uh, fossil dig site and digged up uh, uh, fish fossils it was pretty cool um, we're planning one later this summer hopefully fingers crossed um, where uh, we're going to invite everyone out to um, uh, go scuba diving. There's a, um, there's a place out west a bit that, uh, that you can go uh, and go scuba diving for the day and just have a barbecue and hang out and do some fun stuff there. So we, we try and, you know, really educate people, but also have a lot of fun stuff as a club too. Um, so let's talk about marine aquariums and what it might take to, to start one. Um, I'll, I get a lot of questions sometimes when I'm talking to people, um, really kind of the big scary ones, like, is it hard to keep a marine aquarium? And um, the answer to that is sometimes. Uh, it really depends on what, what you're trying to do. It's, it's not as simple as a freshwater aquarium. It's not, um, you know, as simple as just having a, a goldfish. There's, there's definitely a lot more involved. But um, nowadays, it's actually not that hard to keep an aquarium. Um, when people were keeping aquariums back in the 70s and 80s, um, there really wasn't a lot of knowledge about what was necessary uh, to keep some of these saltwater uh, creatures alive. And so it was a lot harder back then. Right now we have a lot better understanding of what is necessary to 
keep them alive? What conditions do they need? Um, the distribution of that information, you know, you can go online and find all kinds of amazingly useful information. Unfortunately, you can find a lot of misinformation as well, but um, you just got to be kind of uh, careful about what you're doing and make sure you, you do um, research it well. Uh, we also nowadays have a lot healthier and heartier livestock. Um, it used to be that, you know, people would just go out in the ocean and grab stuff off the reef and bring it home. And it wasn't very healthy by the time they got it to their aquarium. And so the survivability wasn't, wasn't very good. Um, nowadays, the chain of custody for livestock from the reef to the home is, is much, much better. But in addition to that, we actually have a lot of uh, uh, like captive bred fish or um, uh, aquacultured corals that are grown in the tank and propagated between hobbyists. So there's a lot of uh, livestock out there that has been, you know, pretty much raised in the tank and is much more uh, adapted to, to uh, that environment. Um, we also have a lot more technology out there. There's a lot of really cool equipment that um, helps make keeping the aquarium uh, easier to, to handle. Um, here in Salt Lake City, we are really blessed with having uh, a very large local support group there. Like I said, there's a lot of hobbyists out here. And if you have questions, um, there's a lot of ways to get information about that. Um, you can, you know, I've gone over to people's houses to help them with uh, problems they're having with their tank. Um, sometimes emergencies do happen. You know, you might have uh, some piece of hardware fail or you might, heaven forbid, have a, have a tank uh, crack on you and start leaking. Um, and there's a lot of great people who, will, who, who step up and help uh, with that. So it's, it's pretty amazing to be in this hobby here in Salt Lake City. Um, Another big question I, I will get is how expensive are marine aquariums? And um, just like everything in life, um, it, it can be expensive. It doesn't have to be expensive. Um, one of the things that really uh, you can decide is how much time you want to personally invest versus how much money you want to spend. There is a big trade-off there. There's a lot of stuff that you can invest in to help automate the tank management and make things um, a, a little bit easier, but there's nothing that says you have to do that. And, and you, there's all sorts of ways to do that just with a little bit more um, personal time investment. Um, there's also a question of, of how big of a, of a salt lake tank, uh, or sorry, a salt water tank you want. And, um, you know, a smaller tank is, is definitely a lot less expensive. Um, there's all-in-one options out there, so um, you can put together a tank piece by piece with different equipment and try and, you know, personalize it as much as you, as you want. But there's also tanks that you can just buy that has everything already included, and you just add the water um, and, and get the cycle running and then add your livestock. Um, there's also, again, because Salt Lake City has a lot of hobbyists, there's a lot of people out there who will upgrade equipment and have... Uh, used equipment that's still in perfectly great condition. Um, you always have to be careful with used, condition, used equipment and make sure that you check it and, and know that it is good, but that's a really good way to save money. It's, it's amazing. You'll have somebody who puts together a, you know, a 40 gallon tank because they um, aren't sure what they want and they get so excited about it that they decide they want to replace it with a 100 or 200 gallon tank. And now they have all this equipment that isn't really good for that larger tank, but hasn't been used but more than a few months. And, you know, they're willing to sell it for just a fraction of the price they bought it for originally. Um, but ultimately, the sky's the limit. If you want, if you have the budget and you want to spend more money, there's always ways you can, you can find to spend lots of money on a tank. It just, don't, don't let that scare you off. If you, if you want one, there's lots of low budget ways to uh, be able to get a saltwater tank going. Um, what size aquarium do you need? Um, this is a really important question because it, it really um, makes you think about what exactly do you want out of your aquarium? Um, like I had said, I was looking at that um, rectangular trigger fish and in my research, I learned that it is a very um, 
active fish. It, it swims a bunch and it actually needs a minimum of a six foot long tank. Uh, and so that put me up at around a 200 gallon tank in order to have that fish. Um, so it's important to know what you're looking for and to do some research into what you think you may want. Um, we, we have people here around the valley that have tanks as small as five gallons um, and tanks, uh, there, there's some members that have tanks upwards of 800 gallons. Um, so there, there is a, a wide variety of what you can do. Um, both, both ways have certain advantages and disadvantages. Um, smaller tanks, this one here you see at the top is a, a 20 gallon tank uh, set in the wall. Um, they're a lot less expensive to get going. Um, it's much easier to find a place to put a smaller tank and there's some aspects of maintenance that is a little bit easier because there's less water that you have to change out regularly. There's less additives you might have to deal with. Um, so so there, there's all that going for a small tank. Larger tanks, however, um, tend to be much more stable. You have a lot more water volume in them and so if something's going wrong, um, it takes a lot longer, you know, if pollution could build up in a small tank very, very quickly because there's not much water there uh, to buffer that, that pollution wherever it's coming from. Uh, a larger tank, you, you have a lot more uh, leeway to deal with that. Uh, you also have more options in what you can do. A small tank definitely limits the kinds of fish or the kinds of corals that you could have in there. Um, larger tanks, you, you have, uh, you know, just much, much more options on what to, to do. Um, there's also less competition in the tank. One thing to, to keep in mind is that these animals that you're putting in there um, need their territories. They need to, they'll protect the places that they feed from. And so there could be aggression between fish or even between the corals, corals that are not um, compatible with each other that are placed too close will actually um, attack each other through um, chemical means or through stinging, stinging tentacles that they'll put out. Um, and so you could have one coral that actually attacks and kills another coral that's, that's too close to it. And a larger tank gives you a lot more uh, ways to decide how to set up that environment. Um, so, so there's a, you know, a, lot of, a lot of choices out there. Uh, so many choices that sometimes it's a little hard to know where to start. Um, People see these aquariums and, and they think they're, you know, amazing looking. Uh, you know, some people set them up as uh, living works of art, practically. Other people like to recreate certain environments um, and, and see how uh, that plays out within their aquarium. So knowing what you want is sometimes tricky. Um, my suggestions is if you are interested in a saltwater aquarium, um, first and foremost, determine your budget decide how much money you do have available to spend because you can spend as much as you want. Um, if you're on a low budget, then that's going to influence your decisions about the size of the tank, the, the kinds of livestock that you can put in there and so on and so forth. Um, once you know how much money you have to spend, figure out how big you want the tank to be or how big you need the tank to be. Uh, if there's certain livestock that you are interested in that you think looks really amazing and you want to see in your tank, um, find out what uh, environment that livestock requires and make sure that you do get a tank big enough. There's some people sometimes who buy a, a fish when it's really small and they think, oh, this is such a pretty fish. And they don't look and check to see that that fish can grow to be a foot long and needs a very large aquarium to um, to survive well. Uh, and so a year later, they find that the, the fish is way too big for their aquarium and they're trying to figure out how to get rid of it. Um, so also you need to think about the location of where you want an aquarium in your house. Um, these aquariums are, are really amazing. So finding a spot that you can uh, see it and enjoy it regularly is really important. Also, the more frequently you can see your tank. If you put it off to the side and don't see it so often, it's really easy for little things to happen that you may not notice that build up. Um, so the more frequently you see it, the, the easier it is to stay on top of what's going on in the aquarium in case there's anything that you do need to do to uh, take care of it. Um, another thing that some people don't consider is large tanks are very, very heavy. Um, water 
weighs about weighs I think eight and a half pounds a gallon and you have a lot of rock and sand and then the weight of the glass and the weight of the stand and you know my 210 gallon aquarium probably weighs around three to four thousand pounds and so having a, a, a location in your house that is safe to keep something like that, I ended up having to decide to put my aquarium down in the basement where it can sit on the concrete foundation because it would have required some reinforcing of the floor joists in order to put it in uh, one of the higher floors. So that's something else to think about. Um, and then what type of tank do you want? There's, there's a lot of uh, variety and options out there. Um, there's an amazing variety of corals uh, that you can do. Um, I, I started putting just about every single kind of coral that I thought was amazing looking into my tank. And then I quickly learned those different corals require different water parameters, different feeding situations. And, and so it becomes really difficult to find that sweet spot that every single coral is gonna be happy at. So sometimes if you have something that you know, oh, I really want the pretty uh, branching Acropora, then you can try and find a tank that is much more suited to those corals living well um, and not worry about some of the others. Or maybe there's a specific kind of fish you want. Um, there are certain fish that actually eat corals and can't be kept in a tank with corals. Uh, so there are people who keep fish only tanks with just rock and artificial corals for appearances, but the only thing living in the tank are the fish. Uh, sometimes that's actually easier to deal with. Sometimes the fish are easier to take care of than the corals. The corals, um, you know, they're, they're invertebrates. They don't move around, but they, they actually are living animals. And it's hard to tell when they're, happy or unhappy. A fish, it's pretty easy to see by its behavior of how it's swimming and how it's feeding, um, whether it's doing well or poorly. And corals sometimes are a little trickier. So knowing what kind of a tank you want, what kind of things you want, is going to influence greatly, again, where, where you want it to be, what size you want it to be. And in the end, research, research, research. Um, you, the more you know about uh, the, the livestock in your aquarium, the uh, better you'll be able to take care of them. Uh, I, I think I'm a little extreme on the research end personally. I spent almost nine months um, learning about the kinds of stuff that I would put into my aquarium before I set it up. And, uh, you know, I, I even went to the, the extent of joining the, the Wasatch Marine Aquarium Society. I was, I was the tankless member for, I don't know, almost six months because I just wanted to talk to people and see their tanks and learn about stuff and, and really know what I was doing before I got into it. So, um, and, and when it comes to that, take advantage of the information that's out there. There's lots of information online and then come contact us at the, at the Wasatch Marine Aquarium Society. We, you know, would be happy to share information um, come sit in on one of our meetings. You don't have to be a member. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty amazing hobby and there's a lot of amazing people out there to, to meet and, and learn about uh, keeping a saltwater aquarium. So that's kind of a high level. There's tons more I could go into uh, detail about uh, the livestock and the tanks and, and I will be happy to answer all of your questions here and, and in the future if, if you want to contact me uh, through our website or if you want to come join us at a meeting. So thank you very much everyone.